Jeremiah chapter number eight tonight. Come on, praise God. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophet and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. They shall spread them before the sun, the moon, and all the host of heaven, whom they've loved, whom they've served, after whom they've walked, and whom they've sought, and whom they've worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. Now, the Bible says in verse 2, in case I don't get a chance or opportunity to preach this, what they were worshipping is what they spread them over. The sun, the moon, the host of heaven, whom they had loved, whom they have served, and after they have walked, and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped, whom they have worshipped. There was a mixture of what they were, they were worshipping, okay? They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. Death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue, uh, residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord, shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast de deceit. They refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Yea, the stork in heaven knoweth her appointed times. The turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Father, I bless you tonight and I pray that as we take a few moments to thank you and return our, our grateful hearts for all the wonderful things that you've done this day. We thank you, Father, as we look over our shoulder to glance at where you brought us from. And God, we say thank you. Father God, we are most grateful for all that you are going to do and continue to do. Father, I thank you in advance for buildings that are coming up on this property. I thank you in advance for an army of soldiers that's coming into this house. I thank you, God, for the addition of multitudes of places that, God, you are going to place people and move on people. And that, Father God, we are going to do great and mighty things in the name of the Lord. Thank you for hungry people that come back to church on a Sunday night. Thank you, Father, for family, for sweet fellowship. Thank you for unity. Father, we give you praise. We give you thanks in the name of the Lord. And let everybody say amen and amen. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some thanks. Let's give him some honor. And let's give him glory tonight. Hallelujah. As we look in the word of God, there's a lot to the backstory. As you look at the book of Jeremiah, it's one of those books. I'm telling you, it's, I have read through it uh, several times. And I can tell you, Jeremiah is one of them tough books to read through. Because as you begin to read about it, you see the demise of the people of God, but you also see judgment. You also understand that there is a recompense of reward, and that can go either way. Hallelujah. And so as we just key in on chapter 8 tonight, how's that? I read a lot of the story prior to and just a few verses after, but I really want to look at verse number 7. Verse number 5 to me is just as important. Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by perpetual backsliding. Backsliding has been in the scripture since Jeremiah. It ends up there. We find it throughout the Old Testament. We find the interpretation of it in the New Testament as well. There is a great, there is a great possibility. And it happens and has happened. Where people of God that once knew the Lord, that once walked in his ways, served in his church went to church, maybe even gave, maybe sang in a choir, maybe preached his word, that ends up happening to them what's happened in verse number five, that they backslide, that they turn their hearts against God, that they walk away from the goodness of the Lord. I believe with all of my heart, America is right in the middle of a perpetual backsliding. I may not get a lot of amens tonight for a few moments, but I really need to get through what I'm preaching tonight. 
the moral decay of America to me is mind boggling with all due respect. I humbly say to you tonight that things have changed over the last 10 years. Things have changed over the last five years. Things have changed over the last two weeks. There are so many headlines that are running rampant to make a space on a page that tells you of a horrific scene or a terrible story or another tragedy. Everywhere you look, the love of many has waxed cold. Men are lovers of their own selves. They're covetous, they're boasters, they're proud, they're blasphemers, they're disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, implacable, fierce despisers of those that are good. There's one for you. I have never seen a day in time when people hate good things. I just don't know what's so bad with living good. I just don't know what's so terrible about trying to live righteously. I don't know what's so bad with trying to live a clean life, a pure life, and a holy and acceptable life unto the Lord. I just don't get it. There is nothing in this book that's going to hurt you or harm you. There's nothing in this house by the atmosphere and the presence of God only, I say from a heavenly perspective, that's ever going to hurt you. Now there's people involved and anytime there's people involved, there sometimes can be some misunderstandings, some offenses, and there can be people that get their feelings hurt. I'm not giving you any promises on that. But what I'm going to tell you is I believe we are a perfect church for imperfect people. I believe you are filled up for the most part inside of a building we call the tabernacle, we call redemption, that is seated together in heavenly places. People that want to see you succeed and people that want to see you blessed and people that want to see you make it and people that want to see you prosper and be happy, but more than anything, people that want you to be saved. Now, for those of you that may not have much church background, to those of you tonight that are trying to understand what is this backsliding business, let me tell you, saints of God, it is when you get saved and ask Jesus to come into your heart, when you have and begin a relationship with the Lord, and at some point in your life, and only God knows why people do this, but they decide that they're going to get out of church, or they're, they're going to stop reading their Bible, or, or they don't have the joy of the Lord anymore, or they're going to let all the circumstances of life just overwhelm them, and they just turn their back on God. Jonah got real close to it if you want to read your Bible. Jonah got real close. He bought him a ticket and he went down and he went down and he ended up going down by the dock, down into the sides of the boat. And the Bible says until the mariners, the seamen there, they threw him out after throwing out most of their belongings. Then they threw him out and God had prepared a great fish to swallow him. Let me tell you something, God will fight for you. When you call him your father, your friend, you love him, you bless him, you praise, you worship, he will come after you. And let me tell you something, there is nothing like the misery of a backslidden person. There is nothing like the misery of someone that once knew the Lord and turned their back on God. Because there is nothing in the world that there is no plan B God, there's no plan C church. There's no plan D place for backsliders to fellowship and sing amazing grace. This is it, saints of God. This is the church. This is the body of Christ. This is a representation of his church. We may not get it perfect all the time, but I can tell you unequivocally, the spirit of God rests on this house. The spirit of the Lord moves through this place. And we try to preach as accurately as we can. I study to show myself approved hours before I preach messages. Hours upon hours of messages over 25, 30 years of preaching and pouring my heart into the word of God to make certain that I get everything right. I'm telling you, saints of God, it can happen. The prodigal son is another great example that if he would not have gotten a hunger to come back home, he would have never been able to get back to the house unless he said, what have I done? I've come to myself. I'm sitting here eating with the pigs. It started out, I was on a journey away from my dad. I'm a prodigal. I left the house. I said, I want to do stuff on my own. And I went ahead and I left. And when I got to the place where all the people I ran into, I thought were friends. I thought were going to treat me good. They took my money. They took my clothes. They took my good watch and my good shoes. And here I am begging for somebody to let me 
do the lowest degrading job there is and that's to feed the pigs not only did he end up feeding the pigs but he ends up eating the same food that the swine did eat saints of God I'm telling you if there was not a day that he woke up and said what in the world is wrong with me I'm feeding the pigs I'm sleeping with the pigs my muddy feet are a mess my body is a wreck and I've got a home and I've got a bedroom and I've got three hot meals a day and I'm sitting here messed up in this dilapidated circumstance what in the world has happened because he backslid and he got away from God that's the story The story goes on to say that he woke up and realized, I don't have to be here. One of the greatest things you can do in your life is realize you don't have to live that way. One of the greatest things you can realize is I don't have to eat this junk. I don't have to infiltrate this mess in my mind. I don't have to walk around like this. God has something better for me. The greatest thing that people can realize is there's a God in heaven that sent a precious son, the sacrificial lamb, that we might live and have life abundantly, that shed his blood that went to the grave and on the third and appointed morning he arose up over death, hell, and the grave. Before he ascended, he descended. He took back the keys of death, hell, and the grave and came out with a resurrected body. My God, I feel like preaching here tonight. We've lost our reverence for the house of God. We've lost our reverence for that which is holy. We've allowed our young children, we've allowed our teenagers to be overwhelmed with the confusion of society that they are to be confused. We have done that, not us, not this church. Our society has confused our children. We never had problems like we have now when I was growing up in school. I knew who I was. I knew that exactly what I just feel like I'm going to preach tonight. I'm... I, I, listen, I just might as well tell you, I pulled the filter out tonight. I'm going to say exactly what needs to be said. I, I realize, you know what, I'm beyond trying to make everybody happy. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I've got to say what i got to say. It is a sad shame. It is unbelievable to look around at what has walked into our school system and parents have not had enough of God to pray and say, devil in the name of Jesus. You back off of my children. You back off of my grandbabies. You back off the playground. You back off the lunch table. You get out of our science department. You get out of our health department, biology, geography, social studies, math, English, Come on, somebody. The devil is after our children. You know, verse number seven says this. Yea, the stork in the heaven knows her appointed times, the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. I believe as much as we are in a grace dispensation. That means that we are in a grace dispensation. We have lived through a lot of dispensations. If you really study the word of God, you can find there were dispensations. Some years back, we'll say the 50s or 60s, maybe leaking in into the 70s, there was this healing work. And there was a lot of incredible, what we would call generals of the faith that had healing ministries. And we would watch them erect great tents and five, 10, 15,000 people would show up and God would do the miraculous. And we would say that was a healing ministry that really hit the earth. And then the evangelists came in and there was an outpouring of souls being saved. Billy Graham, that when you watch his messages, it was almost like the sweet anointing of heaven just anointed him to be able to go into coliseums and into, and, and into stadiums where they played baseball or otherwise and pack the place out and they would sing songs and he would begin to preach to them and it was messages about salvation and the goodness of God and thousands upon thousands would be saved. Evangelist Reinhard Bunke that Brother Render talked about millions of people overseas. I'm not talking about millions saved. I'm talking about a million in a service. 
and they would put speakers up everywhere. And those, I believe those were dispensation, blocks of times that we saw God move. But then I feel like the restrainer, the, the restrainer, which is us, the body of Christ, the spirit of the Lord is the restrainer. I believe that with all of my heart. And the restrainer is in this church. The restrainer is in the people of God. And we are out here to restrain people. But I feel like that we've got to be cautious because the Bible said when Jeremiah was speaking, he said, nature knows times. Nature knows seasons. Leaves know when to fall. Flowers know when to blossom. Uh, the, the, the hummingbirds know when to fly south and come back. Geese know when to take off and come back. Robins know when to start singing. Cardinals know when to gather together. And squirrels know when to, to sleep a little bit and gather up in the leaves and the thickets of the trees. You've seen their nest. A bear knows when to hibernate and come back out at the right time. A snake, everything works like a clock. But here we are not knowing that judgment has come upon us. Saints of God, it's a mess. I don't look for it to get any better, but in the house of God, I look for it to get real good. I look for the Holy Ghost to be poured out like it never has been. I'm telling you, saints of God, I'm, I'm not preaching this because I'm angry. I need you to understand this, this, this is my DNA. This is how I preach. <laughs> I love to smile when I preach things. I got to preach like this, but I just can't. There's something that comes over me. There's an urgency in my spirit that if we don't say it now, if we don't sound the alarm, no one's going to. If I don't say it, then who's going to say it? Who in Dayton, Ohio is going to get in a pulpit and say what I'm saying tonight? I got to ask you the question. If I don't say it, God's saying, who will? Will. Who's going to make it plain? Who's going to help us understand? Who's going to help us know? You're not born that way. The devil is a liar. That, that is a choice. Y'all might as well. I told you I'm taking the lid off tonight. I don't want to watch people backslide on my watch. I don't want to watch a church backslide on my watch. But I'm telling you, saints of God, if we let everything in the world take our time, if we let everything in the world swallow us up, if we have lost our burden, if we have lost our concern, I'm telling you, we need some spirit in church. I, I believe we need education too. We need the word of God, impeccable, infallible, the perfect, inerrant word of God. Preach like it's never been preached before. But I believe you need the Holy Ghost as well. Because in the book of Acts they started getting real dependent on the Holy Ghost and Jesus was baptized when the Spirit of God ascended from heaven descended from heaven rather and a voice said this is my son and whom I'm well pleased that was at the river of Jordan when John baptized him and he came up out of the water thank God there was an illumination of fire upon him saints I don't want you to get mad at me I want you to catch my burden I want you to catch my conviction I want you to catch my hope for this world you don't have to live this way you don't have to live in a backslidden condition God loves you tonight and he gave a son that we might live I don't want you to go to hell I don't want you to go to hell I don't want you to go to hell I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. Well, now, Pastor, calm down, man. You're making me nervous. Wonderful. Pastor, leave me alone. Leave me alone, Pastor. I just wanted to come here. I have my reasons. I just wanted to come here and show up. As the people I know, there's some friends I have here. I'm glad you came for that reason. But God has another motive. God has another motive. Pastor, leave me alone. Back up. Pastor, leave me alone. I don't think there's anything with a little drinking. Would you think there would be anything wrong with me slipping out on my wife, but it's just a little bit? I bet not. 
You see what happens is it's a little of this and all of a sudden it's a little of this too because what started out with just one little thing I was doing wrong turned into another little thing I was doing wrong and the next thing you know I got another little thing I'm doing wrong and the next thing you go out on another little thing I'm doing wrong and how much is little and how much is in proportion and how much is moderate and how much should it be that it's too much and who's to decide the Bible said in Galatians that a little leaven leavens the whole lump if you let that enemy come in there he will gain a foothold on your life. I don't know whether to keep preaching or talk to you. I feel the Holy Ghost in my soul. I feel fire in my voice. I feel fire in my heart. There is a burden that I have for people. I want you to know I love you tonight. I love the ones that don't look like I do. And I love the ones that are trying adamantly not to look like us. I love them and I care for them. But I'm not going to hell over a drink. I'm not going to hell. I'm not going to hell and backsliding over a bunch of mess in the name of Jesus that the enemy wants to pull me away it's not worth it oh my god can I keep on preaching what are you willing to what are you willing to compromise and not miss what God has feel some fire in my soul tonight I feel some fire in my soul. I pray you leave here and say, he did some old-fashioned fire and brimstone preaching tonight. I pray that's what you say. What is moderation? What is moderation? Is there a place in the Bible where we can find moderation as to how much we can have and it's moderate and it's okay? Come on. Jesus never said, you know what, uh, I'm, I've been 40 days in the wilderness. Yeah, I'm tired. And uh, you know what? Just a little stone. Uh, just a little stone. I'll go ahead and make that bread. I'll just take a little piece of it. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. But every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus knew there was no compromise. I'm telling you, saints of God, there was no compromise. He was perfect. Saints of God, we are living in this chapter of Jeremiah number 8 I want to preach tonight that you feel hell under your feet you might say preacher what's hell that's the alternative and that's not the place that you go when you die that's the place you start to live like when you reject God like hell I think a lot of people think, I'm going to run from God and have it my way. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be joyful. All my friends are going to party. I'm so sick of going to funerals where they think they can go to, to heaven and party. And they're going to listen to all kind of music and slop. And we're going to drink and party when we get there. Heaven is not like Dixie, brother. Heaven is not some country party. Ain't nobody doing the watermelon crawl up in heaven. Ain't nobody drinking all that liquor in heaven. Ain't nobody smoking no blunts in heaven. Ain't nobody getting high in heaven. I might as well just preach what I feel. I'm telling you, it's a sanctified life. It's a holy life. And be ye separate and come out from among them. It don't happen. Church, I love you tonight. Church, I love you tonight. This battle that you see me battling while I preach tonight, it's a battle from heaven and hell. The enemy is trying to come in here and have his way and push his agenda. But I'm telling you, even the stork knows. The Bible says in verse number seven, the turtle and the crane, the swallow, observe the time of their coming. But the end of that is, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. You should never want to ask how much can I get away with and still go to heaven. It's like me asking a precious woman that married me and gave her life to me as I gave mine to hers and we gave our lives to the Lord. Honey, how much? Oh, honey, I love you so much. But I'm just kind of wondering how much can I go out here and get away with and come back and still call you my wife? How much 
church. How much are you willing to share what God has given you? over compromise and then they let it come back in your house while you've been out gallivanting around and doing everything you can and then come back to me and, and oh come on somebody help me now and this is where the Bible says oh I know I'm preaching plain tonight oh my God oh God somebody is going to be mad tonight but my people know not the judgment of the Lord I don't preach like this very often but when I get a push from God, preach to people, preach to people. Saints, I preach like this because I love you tonight. And I want you to know tonight that I have seen a lot of people that God started in a good way. Oh, I've watched them come in and I've watched God give them houses. I've watched God give them children. Come on, Nicholas, and play so, so it'll help me close this out because... I feel like God is moving right here. Saints, I love you tonight. I love you tonight enough not to apologize for what I've preached. I love you tonight to tell you that I've, 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 I've preached pretty close tonight. I made it real plain tonight. But I'm telling you, if I don't make it plain, the enemy's going to come in and scoot right up next to our young people. And he'll get in their phones at night when they're laying in bed. And he'll start talking to them through them phones. He'll get them on TikTok and Instagram. And then they'll challenge them on TikToks. You girls kiss a girl. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm preaching tonight that the devil is a liar. They'll dare some of you young men to give up your credibility and character. And give up your manliness and your godliness. Brother God, me, my heart is stirred tonight because the Bible said, Jeremiah said, there will be a time that my people will not know the judgments of the Lord. I don't want to be known as that church that has no concern, no care, no burden for people that have lost their way to God. I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about being a good person. I'm saying they've lost their way to God. Let me make it as plain as I can. They've lost their way to God. That's where we are, saints. Who's going to tell this? Who's going to pick their Bible up and preach Jeremiah chapter 8? I'm preaching about spiritual warfare Wednesday. And all through February, I'm going to preach on spiritual warfare. And let me tell you something, that devil in hell is not going to like what I've got to say. Because we will expose him. We will expose him. Just in case you thought I was talking to you tonight, I got this earlier than before I walked in here and seen you. And I knew, and if you want to ask my wife, you can. Because she saw me in my word. And this is what God told me to say tonight. And I almost felt like he wanted me to this morning. And I felt like God said, preach it tonight. Parents, you better watch what your kids are watching on that phone. They'll get to a certain age where you can't do much about it. But if they're living in your house and you're paying that bill, praise God. We're living in a time when there's zero accountability and it's so dangerous. I have to have accountability. When I preach, I have to have accountability. I have people that listen to everything I say when I'm preaching. And if there's ever a time that we need to, we have a talk about doctrine. Or we have a talk about the word of God. Or we have a talk about current events. There must be accountability. 
I have people that I talk to often and they don't always pat me on the back. Sometimes they help fine tune me and speak to me because I've made myself available to listen. Saints, we have to be careful. It's unfortunate that the iPads, surface tablets, am I getting it right? Smartphones, computers, They'll take you and show you anything you want. You've got to be so careful. Got to be careful when little kids come to your house. It, it, I, I, it's so sad. It's so sad. Can't close the door on them. Got to keep your eye on them. Make sure everything's above board here, children. You got to be protective, parents. <clears throat> Pray I've not made anybody mad. You've got to be so protective. You've got to be so protective. I don't care who it is. Everybody needs accountability. Everybody. Praise God. I said what God wanted me to say tonight. I don't want us to get remotely close to giving up throwing in the towel or quitting I don't want us to get remotely close to backsliding I know it's old fashioned I know people don't preach like this anymore but you know what we need this every once in a while we just need a little reminder don't even get close so show us your